So uh, I'll talk a little more about the clinical aspect, the feel <coughs> of the stent, and how does it compare to uh, uh, conventional FRED. Uh, these are my disclosures. Um, so all this work is done at Thomas Jefferson University in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, we're going to uh, do a little bit of a historic review of f conventional FRED. Uh, flow diversion revolutionized the way we treat aneurysms. Uh, just by a threefold increase in surface coverage area, we have remarkable results. We have to go back and ensure safety. So as we look at FRED X, we have to compare to conventional FRED, and this is our safe trial uh, looking into anterior circulation aneurysms a centimeter or less. Um, and again, these are the occlusion rates uh, uh, at one year, 81%. You see the follow-up that we have from Europe already at one year, you guys were close to 90%, so it looks already that we have higher occlusion rates. And most importantly, the safety, morbidity, and mortality, and that's what we're looking very critically as the, the FredX follow-ups follow are coming through. There's a lot of registries. This was a large, nearly one, uh, 200 aneurysm regis registry from Italy, and their six-month follow-up from Fred was excellent, and 95% occlusion. Uh, with a slightly higher morbidity. So FRED FDA approved in 2019, and again, FRED X only a few months ago in the U.S. Uh, on label, again, similar with both products, Petrus ICA to carotid terminus. Uh, we're going to stick with that indication here for this lecture. And again, diameter uh, up to 5 millimeters uh, with uh, a neck greater than 4 millimeters. Uh, so metal surface uh, coverage between 28 and 33 percent, and uh, again the the dual tantalum helices, which I think are very important in terms of delivery of the stent and ensuring that you have good uh, wall opposition. Uh, I was talking to your engineers earlier. One of my favorite aspects of uh, of the Fred concept is the the, the proximal and distal tips. Um, that really I feel like are uh, the provide better anchoring support and again the non-flow diverting segment makes a huge difference uh, when you're considering sidewall arteries and uh, distal paraclinal aneurysms close to the bifurcation. We saw an example inside where the A1 was jailed and um, there's no need to do that if you have a, a stent like this. Uh, just, just simply, when you first start deploying these stents, always use triaxial support. It may feel unnecessary, but similar to any new product or device, you need to be comfortable with a device before you start getting um, you know, more simplistic and, and minimizing the system to decrease complication. So I always do this uh, with uh, uh, whatever proximal guide you like, Neuron Max, and then a Sophia 6 French and uh, the Headway. Um, we were fortunate to do the, um, uh, the first uh, FRED post-FDA approval, and these are um, our uh, cases from the SAFE trial with, you see, very nice obliteration uh, from the conventional stent. Uh, these stents are very similar, so as you see in the video, the distal tines, unlike uh, other flow diverters, for example, the pipeline, they open immediately. You don't have to... Uh, give 50%, <coughs> form the cigar, smoke the cigar, none of that. You position the stent where you want it and you simply start deploying. This is very important, especially because we're training uh, fellows in this. Um, you always worry about dragging the stent, especially in the M1 segment and the lenticular strides. There's really no need for that here. Uh, these are some examples of uh, six-month follow-up again on the conventional FRED, which nice uh, contrast stasis, the uh, eclipse sign, which is a very good prognostic indicator of 100% aneurysm occlusion at six-month follow-up. Coil assistance, similarly, will do in aneurysms that are intradural and greater uh, than one centimeter uh, to protect from a delayed hemorrhage. Uh, these are some complex bilobed ruptured aneurysms that were treated with the FRED device. Um, uh, similarly uh, to other, uh, other stents, the FredX technology, I'm not going to dwell on the surface modifiers because you got a nice overview from the previous lecture, uh, but it really makes a difference. And uh, besides monitoring for a decrease in ischemic events, what we really need uh, 
uh, randomized clinical trials is to see do we need dual antiplatelet therapy uh, or can we use a single antiplatelet therapy. Uh, that would be ideal moving forward. Um, we, uh, so far we've done close to 20 aneurysms. We did the first FREDX uh, in the U.S. Uh, successfully. And uh, this is one, uh, some of the examples of cases that we've done. This is a patient with uh, a ruptured aneurysm. You see this irregular left-sided uh, uh, PECOM, uh, underwent craniotomy for microsurgical clipping, and then uh, was noted to have a contralateral superior hypophyseal artery aneurysm. We brought her back a few months later for elective flow diversion with a FREDX device. Antiplatelet protocol, and this was one of the questions I wanted to ask uh, 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 Mark in terms of the two thrombosis you noted, have, if you um, check P2Y12 levels baseline just to ensure it's, it's very important. And with the new generation flow diverters, I have a low threshold to switch to ticagrelor 90 milligrams BID. Uh, so favorable inhibition, 30 to 90 percent, and um, uh, again, low threshold to slick, switch from uh, clopidogrel to TICAG. Um, you'll see here, uh, this is expedited, we don't deploy that fast, but uh, um, very steady deployment. You don't have to drag in the M1. You position the stent where you want it, and I really think the distal tines uh, anchor the stent and uh, provide better support, support uh, especially when you telescope stents. Uh, the proximal tines open immediately and uh, this is the, the final run. In terms of sizing, I feel like uh, when we first started doing FRED, we were pretty true to size. Now uh, I'm, I'm starting to oversize by a little bit, by at least uh, uh, half. Um, uh, of the vessel size. So for example, uh, in this case, I had a 4.1 millimeter maximal diameter vessel. My stent was a 4.5. Uh, so instead of uh, you know, choosing a 4 and you know, trying to make it fit by uh, uh, you know, passing your microcatheter and a microwire through, just oversize the stent, um, you will still get the same flow diversion and you actually decrease the risk of ischemia. Um, this is a patient uh, that we actually, I'm not sure if there's any reports of bilateral FRED access, but uh, I did a bilateral case in this patient. She has a history of uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, basilar apex artery aneurysm. She underwent successful endosacular flow disruption with a web device. Unfortunately, she's a heavy smoker. Despite counseling, she continues to smoke, so you'll see a lot of devices here. Uh, she underwent uh, 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 treatment uh, endosecular of this right of thalmic and came back with a recurrence in two years. And this is a, a great case to do a, a, an elective uh, flow diversion. We treated her, and again, you see here it's a 3.5 uh, millimeter vessel approximately, and I used a 4 by 1812. I'm also more inclined to use shorter lengths, again, because there's really no migration of the stent, um, and you can very well uh, position the stent exactly um, uh, across the aneurysm neck. It is so important, that's why I'm playing the video, to really watch those helices develop. I feel like one of the complexities of the stent, it's, it's much easier to deploy in uh, relation to other conventional flow diverters. However, you really have to pay close attention to the helices because you, um, uh, you may not be as inclined to visualize that stenosis because it presents with stretching of the helix uh, as opposed to, for example, a pipeline shield where you can actually visualize the entire stent and you will see the stenosis. So for operators that are first starting to do this, this is something very important. And I wonder, uh, if, you know, that contributed early on to some um, of the thrombotic events. Uh, this is the injection. Obviously, this is a very shallow neck aneurysm, but you still see some stasis within the aneurysm neck. Um, this is the native uh, post-treatment. Uh, 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 she actually had a recurrence of her basilar as well and uh, underwent uh, uh, another endosecular device for treatment. So she presented with a mere contralateral left of thalmic artery aneurysm, and uh, she did well from the previous treatments. Um, and uh, decided to do a contralateral FRED X. Uh, these were the measurements, 3.5 millimeters. I upsized to a 4 by 2317. 
Um, you can see here on the, on the lateral the ophthalmic artery aneurysm. And uh, uh, this is on the native on the right side. Again, you have to sometimes take your time deploying the stent and watch those helices, make sure they're nicely compact and they're not stretched because uh, you will have significant instant stenosis. This was brought up in the meeting. This is the last 20% uh, of the stent. You see here, it looks like it's not going to open. <coughs> I have yet to see a FRED or FRED X not open in the proximal most part of the stent. So what I tell our trainees, if, if you are at least two thirds out and you feel like you're developing a strength sign or you're not going to open, just push it out. It will open. Um, and if for some reason it doesn't, which I haven't seen, simply writing the microcatheter through will open. Those, I really think those proximal and distal tines anchor and have a higher radial force and want to open. This is the final angiogram. Um, the aneurysm, um, you can see superimposed laterally uh, on the carotid. And we have a really cool native uh, uh, picture here. You see bilateral fret axis and web and uh, a contour in the same patient, which is pretty remarkable. She unfortunately continues to smoke, but I do look forward to seeing her um, a follow-up six-month angiogram. <coughs> This is another patient that we did a few weeks ago, um, a right carotid ophthalmic artery aneurysm, a 52-year male presented with headaches. Um, again, uh, similar sizing, um, 3.2 distal, 4.3 proximal. I went with a 4.5, and I almost upsized to a 5, but uh, um, my rep this, uh, it instructed me against this, so I stuck with a 4.5. Um, you have to consider also when it comes to sizing elongation uh, when you're really downsizing, uh, I'm sorry, upsizing your stent too much and always, you know, don't be apprehensive to choose a smaller stent, a smaller length because it does deploy exactly where you need it to. Uh, similarly here, um, the last 25% of the stent just push the device out. Don't try to wag the tail and walk the dog and all the other maneuvers you may get used from other flow diverters. Uh, resheathability is very important. I have resheathed Fred X up to three times. Uh, some of it is letting the, the fellows uh, starting to deploy and if I don't like the position, it doesn't stretch. It really resheaths and unsheaths uh, very nicely, um, most likely having to do with the dual tantalum helices. And uh, when it comes to uh, deploying the device uh, and resheathing, the resheathing you pull back 75% um, uh, and then push the microcatheter last 25%. Uh, this is another patient with uh, superior hypophyseal artery aneurysm headaches and a family history. Uh, this is the 3D reconstruction. Um, and these are again uh, the device measurements. Uh, uh, four millimeter stent, um, uh, head weight, 27 microcatheter, and this is sometimes with the superior hypophyseal, as you see, you have a pretty steep uh, uh, curve in the paracliner, and that could be challenging to um, uh, deploy your microcatheter. Again, uh, look here, watch the helices. Uh, here in the anterior genu, you see that I'm starting to stretch the helix on the native. You need to recognize early, load the system forward to open up the helix. And um, this is uh, the final deployment. So uh, all in all, in our series of uh, nearly 20 patients, we've had no complications, uh, no thrombotic events, most importantly, and 100% uh, ability to deploy the device. No follow-up uh, uh, yet. This is the final on that case. You can see here how the helices are not stretched as opposed to when I was halfway deployed. So um, the bottom line is uh, it's so far the safety data is excellent. Uh, deployment and behavior very similar to Fred and Fred Jr. Uh, we'll, we'll look at the six month follow up and uh, uh, look forward. We're starting a collaboration with uh, the top 15 centers in the country that have done Fred X cases and hopefully we'll have the paper out soon for publication. So thank you for having me and I'll stick around for questions. <laughs>